Good evening, good evening. It's Don. Uh, we have some special guests today, which we will be bringing out in just a matter of a couple moments here. Uh, before we get into the show, I just wanted to do a, a couple updates. I called out um, something that uh, in a, one of my videos on ribbons, <clears throat> excuse me, I will be announcing a winner at the end of one of the videos, either up on Saturday or Sunday. I've already found out who is literally the one who posted the very first comment on that one. Uh, for those in Patreon, I'll have a video up tomorrow. Uh, I had had some things that I was dealing with, so I did not get it processed as of yet. It's edited. I just didn't process it. It hasn't been uploaded. So it will be up fairly early tomorrow. Um, video update on glitches will be up tomorrow, too. I found something else out that I think everybody probably should be looking for. It'll be a big explanation on the whole thing. Let me make sure everybody can hear me. Um, but there will be an explanation on something else I found. It may be tied to this whole thing. <clears throat> uh, so I do have a video coming out with that. Uh, I want to thank quite a few people. You'll probably see some call out thank yous in that video, too, for all the folks that have helped with sending out things and uh, helping me with uh, checking on which listings and such forth send out uh, notices that I don't ship to people. So glitch is still there. It was checked out today. Uh, it's on every item that I have, as well as I probably received four, almost 500 comments from other people, messages and, and things about that exact same glitch. So it's not some small number of people it's happening to. Just me, just me. And I, that video hasn't been watched a whole bunch of times. I've gotten almost 500 call outs or uh, people reaching out saying the exact same thing is happening to them. Some of them are even worse where people can't pay and all sorts of other things. But <clears throat> that'll be the topic tomorrow. I do have a bolo video as i said for those in patreon i will probably post a few other things we're going to go in depth on the topic at hand in patreon and another video with some more inside detail where you see some of my numbers so anyway without further ado we're going to pop on the very special guests i have here we're going to introduce you if you do not know who dave and chuck are um, I think I always mix up which one's going to be my left and right on the screen here. But we'll we'll say Dave does not have a baseball cap on and Chuck does. So I think that would be the easiest way to distinguish the two without mixing up which one's my left and which one's my right. If you've never been back in the studio area back here and you're little kind of disjointed on things going on it might be a little confusing to you but we're gonna have um and <clears throat> everybody introduce themselves we're gonna talk about volume today so we're gonna start with dave and work our way across till it hits to me here and we're gonna talk about literally how we got into it, who we are in the whole work so dave why don't you start it off right there i'm paper guy um to anybody out there um i sell out of my house i've got a day job um, and you know, family and all that. And then I'm still juggling this as well. I always say on our videos that I've got 15,000 items up. I just checked uh, this morning. I'm up to just over 16,000. So we're, we're growing some and trying to work that around the, uh, the day job and all that. And that's just on eBay. We've got about 25,000 on Amazon as well. And then another thing that I've started to do is I've got a couple of other eBay sites. Um, one that's just doing postcards. That's got a couple of hundred up. One that's just doing comic books primarily, that's got a couple of hundred up. And I've started doing Etsy as well, and that's got about 150 up. And really, when you get right down to it, I think the secret is, uh, take the Etsy, for example. I'm listing one item a day. Same thing with the postcard and the comic book site. And that may not seem like a lot, but you're putting up 30 a month, and you're slowly building the volume up. And you know, I've been on eBay. Um, I realized it. I, I gave them a call on a problem a couple of weeks ago. And when they answered it, they said, oh, you've been with us since 1998. Well, if you've been putting items up since 1998 and you're not selling everything that you're putting up, you know, you might be growing by by 20 this month and 20 the month after and 15 a month after. Before you know it, you're up at 15, 16,000 items. So that really, when you come down to it, I think that's probably the secret to volume right there is you just obviously you list a little more than you put up and you just do it time after time after time and, and, it, and it grows. Uh, Mr. Magazine, um, had a brick and mortar store for probably almost 30 years, and uh, that's where uh, Paperboy uh, I met. He was helping me out for a while. Um, eventually, we came up with an idea to start listing on eBay, both of us, um, and we grew there. Uh, I got kicked off eBay, um, must have been 12 years ago, something like that, which really was a godsend because it made me grow. I, I ended up finding Amazon, and um, 
we just grew from there. I bought some big collections along the way. And here I am now. I have uh, over half a million items listed online, uh, another half a million ready to be listed if I have the manpower for it. Um, we got a 20,000 square foot warehouse that's pretty much maxed out. Uh, so I'm looking for more storage at some point. Um, you know, that's it plugging away. I got a website also, two websites. So one's adult related, one's mrmagazine.com. And we, uh, we've been growing those as well since eBay had their little uh, adult uh, issue going on there. So, but uh, we're plugging away. We're up to like 15 employees. We've got 11 listers and uh, we're buying more than ever and selling more than ever. The, the, the same same with me. I started off quite some time ago. We've been full time. Oh, geez. I, I, it's hard to even, even remember how long we've been full time, like a good decade or so going on a good decade. We've been just doing eBay for like 11 or 12, well, 13 years, I want to say. It's been a long time. I'd have to sit down and think about that, too, like, like Dave was saying there. Um, we started off small. I never, ever intended to get to any quantity. Um, as of the last yesterday, we're over 30,000 on just the store I share with you, 1.125 million uh, in, in dollar wise. And part of that was seeing these guys here, too, on some of their videos and talking about volume and Chuck's warehouse and quantity. For me, I had a, a epiphany at one point when I saw volume in, in many other areas. And I knew that's the way I wanted to go, but I wasn't as gung ho on the fight. And, you know, these guys are the same thing as me. They're, they've started off small and worked their way up over time. A lot of people get discouraged and, and say, well, you're some big major store and you're, you're this and you're that. And I'm like, you know, I, I started off with one listing. Every Dave started off with one listing. Chuck started off with one listing. Uh, let, let's segue into a, another question here that I, I think we'll all address and we'll do the same order again. Um, I'll start it off with, with Dave here. Did you have a plan to get to the, was your whole plan from day one to be the massive store? Was it to get volume? Was it to have 20, 30,000 items on one platform, another 10, 20,000, another, did you ever have that in mind the day you listed your first item? No, <laughs> that's the short answer. No, but I'll give you a little bit longer answer too. Um, when I first started out, I was absolutely amazed that you could make money at this. I would go to a, I would go to an auction, for example, and I'd buy a box of books and they were the leftovers. There were things nobody else wanted. And I'd buy the box of books for $2 and there'd be 25 books in there. And I'd come home and I'd sell a book for $5. And I was doing the happy dance because I made $5 off one book and there's 24 more books and I spent $2. And, you know, it just was amazing to me that that kind of money was out there. And at that point, I remember seeing the people that knew what they were doing and, you know, they're going bidding 40, 50, 60 dollars on one book. And I said, wow, I, I can't even imagine that. That's that's insane. Kind of wish I could go back in time because I'd be bidding them up and buying those books. But we all have to learn somewhere. Um, and so that was kind of how I got started. I do remember having a conversation with a, a friend of mine on a plane uh, early on. And I had something like thirty five hundred items listed at that point. And I said, my goal is to get to 5,000 items. And I ended up making it to the 5,000 items. And I was very happy about that, but I was just kind of maintaining it. And to, to be quite honest with you, it's probably been within about the last two years or something like that. It's it, basically when eBay made their changes uh, to their fee structure, I moved uh, to a different house and I had at the point that time I had 17, I'll, I'll never uh, forget this. I had 17,175 items up, but a lot of those items were things that were 10, 12, 15 years old. Pictures had dropped off, terrible descriptions. So what I did is when I moved, I went through my inventory and I ended 3,000 items and I got down to 14,000 items, but the 3,000 items I ended, A, they were costing me a nickel a month at the time. So I was paying $150 a month and I wasn't selling $150 worth of them, or if I was, I was essentially breaking even and doing work for nothing. So I, you know, I, I ended the stuff I couldn't find. I ended the stuff that was poor listings. I lotted stuff together and I've started rebuilding since then. And once eBay did the change with their price structure, that's when I said, now I can work on volume because it's not costing me a nickel a month. And a nickel a month may not seem like a lot, but again, I had 3000 bad listings. <laughs> And let so let, let me interject for just one second on what he's saying here. I'm not the only one who this greatly helped. And again, I know people hate managed payments and stuff, but we saved like 
thirteen thousand dollars or some massive amount. I could give you the dollar for dollar amount, but it was like almost thirteen thousand dollars the minute they went to manage payments for us because we weren't paying five cents a piece for like twenty thousand extra listings every single month, and that's just on one store. So this is a big difference. And again, this was a push for me. I, I didn't think about that until you just said that, but yeah, that's when I got more serious than ever. Just like Dave's saying here, I hate to, to interrupt, but that's a good point that, that people saved a heck of a lot of money the minute they did that. I'll, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry. I just had to get that in there. No. And, and I mean, just get right down to it. Um, I went from when they changed the payment structure there or the cost structure there, it's 5,000 items at nickel a piece. That's 250. And the other nice thing was I was able to downgrade my store, which saved me another $200, $180, something like that. So I'm saving about $450 a month at my size times 12. What is it? 48 and six fifty four hundred dollars a year in my pocket right there on that alone. And it also gives me the ability to not worry about it. I can just list anything that I want at this point, because again, I'm at 16,000 at this point. I'm, got forever before I'm going to bump up against another cost increase. Also for me, um, basically we started with the brick and mortar store. My dad, we were struggling in the nineties after the sports industry tanked, but we were always known to be the buying machine of Rochester. So we always had tons of inventory, autographs, sports cards, you name it. And, but at that point we had no one to sell it to. Nobody was coming in. So paper and I were like, Hey, let's, let's check out eBay basically. And that's how we started getting into listing Basically, my shop inventory was getting put onto eBay. So I didn't have to buy inventory. I had a ton of it already. And as we grew and grew and grew, I ended up, you know, like I, I got booed off eBay and then we found Amazon. And at that point, I had a 30 day uh, period where I had no eBay. So I was going all over my house, my shop, finding anything I could put on Amazon. And I grew Amazon, which was, I had, I don't know, a few thousand items in a month there compared to eBay at zero. But eventually, eBay caught up and we just grew simultaneously back and forth. Um, at some point, I needed more help. I hired a couple of people here and there. And once you make that transition into getting employees and growing, you can't really turn back and go back to a one-man gang anymore. I mean, I haven't done it, but I've, you know, I, at this point with 15, I got no shot. So I'm either staying where I am or I'm growing to 15 to 20 employees at this point. But um, you know, I picked up a massive uh, magazine deal in Canada. So that really helped me get into the magazine track there. Um, and then uh, I think back in the day, eBay had rankings of categories and we didn't realize it but like i stumbled onto it and i was like the fifth highest or something magazine that was ebay pulse i don't yeah. know if you remember that or not when they yeah that pulse. that goes back i remember that you could see like where you ranked in the category they yep. actually give you numbers on I, there was i, I want to say you got an email once a month or something maybe kind of like you do for um um i guess top rated seller i get one that says what they've given me every month it's like a breakdown it was something like that i think we got it's i got the same thing for like uh victorian and paper cards and stuff like that yeah so but well for not even trying i was like fifth so i'm like well no let's set the goal let's be number one why not let's try and easily be number one and uh, i did become that and that's where i changed my name at that point i think it was my initials or something was my original username and i changed it to mr magazine you know, but the, even I had other goals at that point. I think it was a big deal to have like 10,000 feedback. So that was one short term goal. You know, once you hit that 100,000 feedback, you know, and then after that point, you know, it's tough to get this. I don't think I'm at 200,000 unique yet. So that's, you know, that's a long ways away. But um, at that point, then my goal started being, you know, more listings, more listings, um, you know, and that's how we got to this point. You know, we're plugging away. Um, right now, I'm putting more time and money into my website. Um, just because that whole eBay ordeal with the adult category. So, but uh, we're doing well there. We're growing that. And hopefully that'll be my, my baby someday. <laughs> yeah, I get you on that. I've got probably a couple thousand adult magazines here right now. I didn't, I'm not going to dump them off. I'll figure out what I want to do with them at some point. But I've talked to other people and there's a couple other people that have been putting together sites on adult stuff too. So yeah, I got you on that one. Uh, for for us, I finished and, and didn't have a job out of school, the economy had crashed and, and we didn't know what else to do. And I started, I've always been able to make money on the side on eBay and said, well, let's, let's try that until I can find a job. And then the job never materialized other than going into a restaurant, which, you know, the pay wasn't enough to even support us at that point. Um, anyway, it just turned from one thing to another, but I never had a plan. You guys never had a plan to be Mr. Magazine or no. Paper Goy. I, I never had a plan to be anything. 
like like Dave was saying, I never even thought you could make a living doing this. I was like, what the, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> How the heck could you make a living just doing this? And I know antique stores have been around and all that. I used to do the antique booths and stuff, but to do it online and that's all you do and you can afford it and money coming in. I just yeah. I thought the idea was just totally crazy. But volume wise, too, and it's something I talk about again knowing Mr. Mag and Dave and, and there's some other folks that I know that dominate some categories too. You don't start off like Chuck bought a collection that bought him into this section. Is that, that's where your big push was for magazines. Was it not your Canadian purchase? Yes. Yep. And that was like, it's volume. I, I never planned on it. Um, Dave's never, we've never planned on saying, Hey, I'm going to be this massive store and that's the way I'm going to go. And I'm going to be able to do this. And it, it's not something I ever planned in any way, shape or form. It's something that happened. And what I sell is just what happened to find me, I guess. I didn't look to sell this specifics and it doesn't sound like Chuck did. What about you, uh, Dave, on what you're specifically selling? Was that always your goal? Hey, I'm going to sell this item or that item. And that's what I'm going to do with, with my business. Well, it's funny you say that because when I first started going to the auctions, I was buying a little bit of glassware. I was buying a little bit toys. I was buying a little bit board games. I was buying books, magazines, anything that seemed like it was going really, really cheap. And I still remember to this day, um, and I don't, I think I've sold one piece of, uh, I guess what we call it, pottery or pottery glass or whatever, it, Hall, H-U-L-L, I think it was, or Hall. Yeah, no, very well. I bought one piece at an auction for a dollar. And I said, oh, I'm going to do really well on this. And I think it took about a year and a half and I sold it for $4. And I said, no, we're not doing pottery. <laughs> and um, so on and so on. So had, and this is, this is the funny thing about it is, had that pottery done well and had I gone to the right auction or the right sale at that point, you might be talking to pottery going right now. I mean, it just, that is how little of a plan I actually had. It's just, I happen to stumble upon the books all the time. Now I do come from comic books and sports cards, so I do come from a paper background. But at that point, I literally had no idea what I wanted to sell, knew nothing whatsoever about it. And once you, and, and this was something other we talked about in a, a live show we had, not this past one, the one before it. And it, it's part of human nature. When you start looking for something, you'd be amazed how much of it you find. And by that, I mean, I don't deal in, in stamps. But let's say that I said, I'm going to start selling stamps. Probably every flea market and most estate sales have some stamps sitting in them. I walk right by them at this point because that's not something I'm interested in. If I wanted to get into cameras, I could probably find a hundred different cameras within a week and a half. Whereas right now I walk by them and be like, no, I haven't, I haven't seen a camera in months. They're sitting there. You just never notice it. But as soon as you decide that's your niche, you start all of a sudden finding them everywhere. Turns out they were there all along. What about you, Chuck? Oh, man. I don't know. Just uh, for me, the, the buying's getting ridiculous, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's almost like an obsession. And my employees think I'm crazy. But then they see these things selling, you know, like they give me a little respect. And, oh, you knew what you were doing, you know. But uh, ever since COVID, really, it's been crazy. The amount of money I've been spending. So I was walking through my warehouse maybe a month ago. I'm looking at all this good, good inventory, not, you know, in the, you know, 10 years ago, a $10 magazine would have been good inventory for me. Now it's just sitting in boxes on a shelf, you know, up in my loft. It's sitting in a storage unit. Yeah, to yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> but uh, um, I'm looking at all this. So something like, I can't be buying at this level with the amount of employees I have. I have to either stop buying, dump this stuff or get more employees. So I end up getting three, four more employees. Um, they all have like niche items they're selling. One may do DVDs, one's going to do sports cards, one's doing laser discs. So they're all going to have a specialty that they're going to get good at. And it's just things that I might have 10, 20,000 each sitting around. So, and at this point I could hire more people, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because our warehouse is getting maxed out. And if you have too many boxes, banker boxes, you know, they're not going to sell that fast. So, but um, we're having fun right now. Chris is around the corner and We've been dumping everything into Amazon and my website at this point, eBay. I'm kind of taking a you know, a little step back a little bit uh, and putting stuff there for now. But if I could interject as well, the other problem, um, you've got the 11 listers. You've got to think also about the back end on that, which is you're listing thousands of more items every month or every week, whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. You're going to be selling hundreds of more items. Yeah. Somebody's got to pack those. Somebody's got to pull those. True. So you can't, 
You can't yeah. go out and hire 25 listers tomorrow Correct. and still have your, your back end be exactly yeah. the same because yeah. you'll never catch up. Yeah, we've been, so well, yeah. yeah we've been training almost everyone at this point to do more things. We've been training, you know, so they're listing first and foremost, but if we need them to pull orders or pack orders, they're going to learn that as well, especially for the holiday season. Uh, my brother-in-law is my packer. He's my manager. He's, he's great. He does everything there, but he can't pack six, 700 items a day during the Christmas season. It's just impossible you know, and do a good job at it with, before melting down after a few days. So, you know, we're training everyone to handle every aspect of the business at this point. Yeah. I remember I, I ran a, a sale. I think I told Dom primetime treasure hunter about this. I ran a sale and we sold like the minute the sale went up, the sales started coming in. And by the morning, I think we sold, this happened twice. And I said, I wouldn't do it again. And I said, Oh, it's not good. There's no way, no way. I want to say we sold like $3,400 worth the stuff it was like 200 and some odd items in like a six or seven hour time frame the time i turned it on went to bed got up early in the morning to, at like 5 30 i was it took me like i was the only one here the, the kids were out the people were at school i think a school was in or something yeah it was it was it was winter or something i want to say it was right around christmas and i was packing myself for like seven straight hours i had tons of other things i should have done and Again, I, I know that's like a problem a lot of people may wish they would have, but yeah. it's frazzling because you're trying to rush it out. you got a deadline. I'm supposed to ship it by 11. I missed deadline on a whole bunch of stuff, sure. you know, on, on some items if I don't get them packed up and out and, and shipped and stuff. I know technically I had 24 hours, but, you know, I don't like to, to put it off on that. Well, the other thing, too, is I don't know if you remember, there was always that rumor and, you know, I, who knows if it's true or not, but there was always that rumor people would talk about, about eBay throttling your sales, where you, you had your level and this was that, this was that. If you, and everybody was against that. But if you think about it logically, I've got 16,000 items up. Some magic way eBay turns on the spigot for me and I sell all 16,000 items <laughs> while we're sitting here. <laughs> I You're don't screwed. have the packing materials for no. 16,000 items. <laughs> You can get them try. locally at least. There's box makers, I'd imagine. You have to, you have to borrow mine. <laughs> I got a hotline to a box guy. So if I ever got in trouble, I could ask him for a pallet and I'd have to pay him an extra 150 bucks probably right. to have it delivered and drop the rest of his duties. Right. But he'd probably do that for me, I would say. But um, you had made some some comments there. Um, where'd I leave that? On all the inventory you're buying. Let, let's talk about inventory for just a second here you touched on having so much and buying it. I've had the same experience because a lot of people need cash and I'm not trying to rip people off. I've had other sellers go yeah. under and things like that. And in, in all honesty, I help people when they do need the money. I give them a real fair price and the whole works, but people say you got all that money tied up into inventory. If somebody saw how much inventory they walk through here, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to get into that, but it, it would be a little shocking for a few people probably that I've got that much, but to me, it, it's it's like investment. And most of the time I get all my money back pretty darn quick within a couple of days. When you're buying these lots, either one of you, uh, Dave, if you want to start or Chuck, well, whatever you want to do on this one, um, you're not worried. I don't worry about how much I invest into it. If I know it's good material, you know, I got the money. I don't really care. It's good material and I've got 20 of them. And I know they're all well, so I'll just keep buying them. Is that a thought pattern in you? I mean, you're not worried about... It's a business expense. You have to spend money to make money. You can't expect to make a lot of money without investing a lot at some point. And I don't take money out. It all just stays in the business. So what's either one of your take? Whoever wants to jump in on that one first. I, I, a couple of different points about that. Uh, number one, I've got the day job. I'm going to be retiring in just under two and a half years. My first thought is at this point with the luxury of the day job, I can afford to buy inventory. I don't know what two and a half years is going to bring. I'm expecting I'm going to be able to buy it, but I don't know that for certain. I'm going to invest the money in my business, which is what purchasing inventory is today, when I can afford it, as opposed to not investing the money at this point. And you know as well as I do that money kind of just figures out a way to disappear. Um, so if I'm not investing in my business, it's going somewhere. You know, whether it's, oh, we're going to go out to dinner, whether we're going to do this, whether we're going to do that. Whereas today I can invest it in my business for the future and I'm doing that. And the other side of it is I don't deal in speculative things. I'm not buying the hot new sports car or sports cards. I'm not buying the hot new comics. 
I, if I have a, a January 11th, 1990 or 1922 uh, Collier's magazine, it's pretty much worth today what it's going to be worth next week and what it was worth a, a week ago. And same number of people are going to want it as long as I use the proper keywords, et cetera, et cetera. Proper artist on those. Yeah. 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 So I'm not going to lose value in anything that I'm buying. The real advantage, I think, of having the inventory levels that all three of us have are, and, and we actually did a video about this as well. The most powerful thing that we can do is not care about a deal. As crazy as that sounds, because we don't need any deals. We're not falling in love with the deal. We can walk away from it. And you've got a deal that you're bringing to us and your price is too high. Well, good luck to you. I'm sorry, I can't pay that. And we can walk away because we, if, if I don't buy your deal, if I buy it, it's just going to pile up. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. If the price is right, of course I'm going to buy it. But if your price is a little too high or I just don't feel right about, hey, I just don't really like listing that or whatever. I can walk away and I don't need to buy for three to five years, I would say. <laughs> Same here. Maybe maybe a little longer, but yeah, I walk my stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking 10 years I got in case, just in case. But uh, my employee's biggest concern always is where are we going to put it? You know, I got 100 boxes coming and where are we going to put it? I go, that's the least of our worries. We got 20 feet in the air, 20,000 square feet around. We'll, we'll have to go to the ceiling if we have to. You know, Let me worry about that. It's a great deal. It's good for business. You know, it's good for your job, you know, security. So let's keep it going. Um, and that's basically it. But we get deals all the time. And, you know, right, like Dave said, we don't have to buy. I'm a competitive guy. I don't like to lose deals if it's something I really want. But I'm not going to pay crazy for it. Uh, if it's a regular that I've dealt with, you know, sometimes I'll get a bigger edge and I might give him the edge next time. But we're usually both happy. But very rarely I want to pay way more. Um, it, was, it was funny. We were talking about that one deal. I had a regular come in and it's usually 10,000 every time he pulls up with a truck. He says, give me 10 grand. And I know it's a deal. And I give it to him. This one time it wasn't a really good deal. You know, so I'm, I'm calling paper boy and he's not answering. You know, I go, I don't know what to do. I want to, you know, I, I think I should get this just anyways. Maybe I'm going to offer a little less. And then he, he sends me this email about, uh, what was it again about the, don't buy, don't buy unless you need to buy, don't overpay. And I'm like, geez, should have answered the phone. I would have told the guy, no, <laughs> you know, so instead of, I think that I offered him seven, he wanted eight, but you know, if Dave called me, I probably wouldn't have bought the deal at that point, you know, but it just a little, it was our difference. He was a little busy, couldn't answer the phone, but you know, you live and learn. And again, it was still a good deal. It was a good customer of mine. We have a good reputation and there'll be more deals down the road. And I think that's something that you've said as well, uh, Don, is sometimes you buy deals off people, deal with them regularly, and it may not be the greatest deal, but you're investing for the future. And I, I always do it. We have a video talking about that as well, insider tips for flea markets. And I will go to people and I will purposely buy an item. Now I'm spending a dollar, not a big deal, but I'm purposely buying an item and mentioning, oh, you always got good stuff. I'm glad I always buy from you and just always mentioning that. And then they know who I am. And even, even if I've never seen them before, hey, I always buy from you. They're like, okay. But they eventually remember you because, hey, you're the guy that comes up, says you always buy and you always buy something. And I don't beat them down on the price or any of that stuff either, generally speaking. You know, they as long as I can make money on it, I'm not much into negotiations. You know, you've got the stuff you want two bucks a piece and I can sell it for 25 bucks a piece. What am I gonna do? Get it for a dollar fifty a piece, you know, on four of them? <laughs> right. Where am I going? Yeah. So I'll make you happy, I'll pay the price. But then you end up putting stuff aside for me. The next time I come to the, the flea market, you say, Hey, hey, I got some paper stuff for you, and you pull it out to show to me directly, and you it, it's fresh to market, nobody else has seen it because you know that I don't beat you up on the price. And on the rare occasion that I do beat you up on the price, you give it to me at that price because you say, gee, Dave's bought for me 20 times and never complained. This time he's asking for a bit of a cut. Uh, maybe I am overpriced on it. And then you end up getting the cut on that rare occasion that they are a little bit higher than, than you want to pay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the same too. Um, I've got pickers. So if, if someone routine person's coming mm -hmm. by or says he's got something, even if I'm not buying, I usually buy something. I don't want them going somewhere else because I haven't bought from them in two months. Every time I go to see them, I feel a need because they went out of their way. They're they're looking for stuff for me. I always look at everything they got, even if I'm full. And most of the time, I end up buying quite a decent amount of stuff. I I, I shouldn't, but you know, again, they, they've they've done me so much good and, and a lot of favors building a rapport with people and, and treating them, you know, right. And, and stuff, I don't try to rip anybody off. I purchased from it. In fact, one time someone didn't feel that the, the deal was, was fair, even though, you know, we agreed on it and, 
you know, I trusted his judgment. He says, you know, I didn't look at the whole, I, I think I sold him like 10,045. So I was clearing out a, a lot. I got a jukebox purchase from a defunct jukebox company out of Detroit. And anyway, I picked out what I wanted and stuff. And I ended up giving him, giving him, I think back like half of his money. You know, I made it up on so many other things that I think the next or the second, second one past that purchase or deal with him, I got a, a local 45 and I made $2,300 on that. You know, I think I paid maybe 150 on a gambit because of condition and stuff on it. And neither of us knew it wasn't in, in the books. I didn't even look it up at that point. We were just he threw out a number and I, what the heck I took. it. I don't even think I looked through the whole lot because I saw some decent ones in there. So it, it, you've got to play the game to some extent, you know, if, it, and I know people say they're, they still have problems with this. When you hit a certain point, volume builds on itself. And once people see that you're buying it, what I find is. Um, it gets around town really quick for anybody selling, although a state sale might call this guy buys that kind of stuff straight out. If you're looking for cash, I only do this. We only do that. Or at a show or something, my name is, Hey, that dude buy, bought me, you know, last four shows, he spent a thousand bucks for me. And, you know, everybody knows who the money makers are at, at state sales, usually at least the estate sale companies around here. And for sure, the antique fairs and festivals that I go to, I know the dealers enough to, you know, pardon me, but shoot the shit with them because we have similar, you know, things. And I see them all over the time if I'm out of, out a bunch. So, you know, inventory volume is always the best. I'm always looking for bulk. Obviously, both of you guys are always looking for bulk. But I only buy good stuff. Again, like you guys are saying, too, I don't have a problem with turning down anything. I, I've had stuff sitting in front of me in, in a video <laughs> here or there that I could have purchased and made some decent money. But I mean, I'm not I'm not greedy. I don't. There's, I don't have to take everything on the table all the time. I don't really click care. I take what I think's neat or that that is appealing to me personally um, and maybe the highest valued stuff too, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I think both of you guys are to a stage where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong though, for me, I sell what I want to sell. I can buy stuff that, that makes me more money than some of the items I sell here, but I have to be semi-ruthless. I have to give up more of my time and stuff. Yeah. And again, this comes back to freedom. Would you say that's the case for, for both of you too, that it, you know, do you get where I'm coming from? Oh, I, I laughed as you were saying it because one of the, the classic example I use in all of our videos are car magazines. I hate car magazines. I absolutely despise them, but you can sell them all day long for 10 to $15 a magazine. If, if I was if if I were at a flea market and they had you know 1970s car magazines and they wanted a quarter piece, I, I'd walk by. I just I have no interest in them, even though that's a good money maker. Hey, you're paying a quarter, you're selling them for fifteen dollars. That's a good money maker. I have no desire at all to do that because, as I've said, um, a good friend of both of ours, radio uh, radio parts, Mike, he he's always talking about you got to make the money. And I said to him one day, Mike I said. Yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. I know Mike's the first person I ever ever reached out and talked to me, and we went. I've talked to him ever since. Yep, and um, he's always like, you know, you've got to get the money. And I said, I've got a job. I said, I don't want another job. And if I buy a thousand car magazines, I've bought myself a job, and I don't want to do that because I have at this point ten thousand unlisted items that I like that I would rather list before I list those car magazines. And to be realistic about it. Say I bought a thousand car magazines. I will never get them listed. I just will not get them listed. Now, maybe if Mr. Magazine were in the market for car magazines, I would buy them at a quarter yeah. piece and flip them yeah. at 30 cents a piece and make something. But then they would end up in a pile in his warehouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I wanted to, I could probably buy 5,000 magazines a day from either locals, um, paper boys contacts. I got deal in Ohio's contacts. It's, you know, I have so much stuff that it has to be worth it for me to buy this collection. So another thing too, is I'm offering less on things like that, that I don't really need and people are still selling it. So, you know, a collection, I would have paid a thousand for magazines a year ago. I'm offering two, three, four, five hundred, 500 and I'm still getting it. So I guess that's a good thing. But, you know, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> but, you, you know, know I turned I down, um, just the other day, the 1930s popular mechanics, all the nice sci-fi covers and stuff. I turned down around 650 of those the other day. I mean, they were cheap enough, but again, they're not worth a fortune each. Right. You know, you'd probably want to list them and in, in some of them would sell. Okay. Because of the artists and stuff on the covers, but I didn't want to mess with them again, just like that. I don't want to sit there because they're all in the same, same price range. Some of them are like $8 a piece. You'd be lucky up to 12, 14. And, 
you know, they're lot material mostly for me is what I do with those. And I don't want to mess with lots of that kind because I don't like dealing with the photos. I try to keep anything I sell down nowadays to four photos with one, the fifth one being for like a double so I can do a zoom in. You know, I don't, I, if I got to do more than that, I'm not trying to be lazy, but I don't really need to do that for 30 bucks. I could sell one item that's 30 bucks. Why would I want to worry about banking together three, three bags every day, you know, 20 of those every hour, whatever, whatever it rolls out to be when, when I can worry about something else. A lot of people think that the, the, you know, it's the money is always the aspect, but you got time involved into it. And if I can list four other items that give me double the amount listed in an hour versus what, you know, a lot like that is I, I'm going to go for the more items with the more dollar value. And I pass on stuff for that basic reason. I mean, at least that's my thinking on it. Would you not agree? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. definitely yeah. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> well, another thing I'm doing now, just because my inventory is so massive, I'm doing a lot more grading because I never did it in the past. And now that I have so, you know, I might have 10 Sports Illustrated issues of Tiger Woods mint condition. Well, what am I going to do with 10 of them? I'm not going to sell one a week. So I have been sending stuff to get graded, whether it's comics, sports cards, uh, even uh, Victorian trade cards. and I'm grading a ton of stuff right now. I haven't gotten anything back, but I spent about 50 grand in the, since January in grading. I haven't received anything back yet. So you don't want to go broke or I want to get a gold mine of stuff to sell at some point. Well, I got a thousand bucks in grading out right now. I've only received the, um, the, uh, the grant back uh, just the other day too. And I sent away that like Frederick Dent grant, the Ulysses S Grant's son. I got letters from him, but um, I, I got that back after, I want to say with the pandemic, it's been almost eight months, something like that. And I paid yeah. for the quicker service where we've been a member and I got the, the you know, all that kind of crap. But I, I know what you mean, having that kind of money out. I, I get it. Plus, oh, with that, the, that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say with the quantity of the same ones, I would probably be looking to do some of that, too. The only other thing I think on stuff like that, like uh, the George magazine. In fact, I got a couple more Georges the other day. I wanted to get in and out on something. Sometimes they're hot at one time and they may never oh, yeah. be hot again too. Right, so, right. you know, sometimes yeah. I'll pass on something because it's, it's on the border of, is it going out like a beanie babies the month before beanie babies are going out? You, you might've been offered because <laughs> some people were aware of what was going on and, and some of that, that they were dumping it. So you yeah. got to think about stuff like that too, or what time of year it is too. I pass on stuff all the time because I just don't want to mess with it. In summer, for one thing, I can probably get it cheaper in summer because everybody's selling more around here. Winter, yeah. everything shuts down around here, you know. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, by the way, you cost me $1,600. I saw your video on the VHS grading. And I just sent, I sent about 24 movies out to get graded. It's a little pricey, but uh, I got some good stuff. So I, I picked well, up I a I've had a lot of people saying, well, that don't sell for that. I've talked to quite a few people, including quite a few that actually had yeah. video or their video shown in there. And from everybody yeah. I've talked to, the ones I talked to, at least, they were legitimate sales. And, and oh, yeah. people say that's that's not true. But just like the the video game grading, too, I, I have people tell me those aren't real and it's all scams. And this yeah, and I've sold some for big money. Yeah, I was just going to say, I personally have seen some in hand that yeah. I got to hold that I know the person who sold it for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So yeah, it's crazy. You know, just like comic books. Yeah. You know, I've seen comic books in someone's hand that sold for over fifty grand because yeah. it was graded when the regular version, yeah. ungraded, may only sell for three or $4,000. It's insane. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't, people just don't understand. A lot of the people that are buying those aren't necessarily buying them as a comic book collector. They're, they're investors to say right. that yeah. they grew up collecting uh, VHS. I know people who have collected VHS tapes for God, I don't know how long I know. I know one person, one person I know that's probably got 40,000 VHS tapes that he personally says oh. he watched every single one of them at least <laughs> once. And that's his whole his whole life is, is yeah. not, I'm, I don't, that sounds bad. It's not his whole life, but that's his whole collecting life. Sure. Is, is VHS tapes. Well, yeah. Isn't it Rob Zombie who has like the biggest collection of horror? Isn't that who that yep. is? Yeah. 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 And, and, and there, there's, there's, there's money in that in grading somebody, you have to start grading somewhere. It doesn't just start off. Oh, the grading's always been there. Every right. time they add a new one in, there's always people rampant saying it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. But, you know, just like uh, grading uh, of comics and stuff, they said, well, that's never going to go and on and on and on. It's fake. Yeah. There, there's there been some stumbles. There's Toy action figures. Yeah. Pardon me? 
toys and action figures too. I mean, you can grade yeah. anything at this point. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And people say, well, they're just trying to make money and, and rake it. But that's the whole point of doing this as a business sure. is to make money. So, yeah. you know, I've sent in stuff, you know, quite often. We've, As I said, I got a thousand bucks in stuff. I, I don't get as much quantity of gradable stuff as you do because I do buy lesser valued stuff when I'm purchasing it. I can flip stuff that's junk yeah. that somebody else doesn't pay attention to. And that's where I started for me anyway. So, um, let me let me touch on one more one more thing. Hang on, now I forgot which one I was going to hit you guys on. Um, okay, now you guys have talked about this. I wanted to touch on one of your guys' videos that was just up the other day. The long tail mindset. Now we're all talking about volume here. Never going to have any way to list this up. You know, I I could probably, again, I probably have ten years of stuff, and I'm not exaggerating. We had a quarter of a million dollars in live inventory on eBay in shirt buttons for crying out loud. Just buttons <laughs> to go on a shirt. I've got a quarter of a million dollars listed in shirt buttons. And that's that's no no lie whatsoever. That's probably about a 15th or 16th of what we have in shirt buttons in here. So again, I never thought I'd be doing that, but but that's where where it comes from. I realize that obviously every aspect of that purchase, and again, we invested $15,000 or something like that. I, in fact, I just sunk in another thousand or so the other day, but uh, I, I know it's going to be a long tail item. I, we've got all their money back out of it at this point, obviously, but I know that the majority of that is long tail. And the mindset, you, you have to not be thinking about, oh my God, what am I going to do with all these? What I got to get them sold. I got to get them sold. Somebody made a comment, and I'm going to take it over to you guys and let you carry on with this in just a second here. But somebody made a comment that he gets them up and, and likes to get them out the door and sell them and aggressively pricing and this and that and this and that. I find with the long tail idea that to have your structure of your entire business and store set specifically. So if you look at my pricing structure, you're not going to find like $5 buttons that look just like my $50 buttons or $5 books that look like $50 books. I've priced everything in the same range. So either you think I'm really high or you think I'm good, but it's a long tail game. I would rather sell one of mine versus three of yours because chances are even my one of mine times three of yours is still making more money than what you sold yours for because people just sure. aren't, they want that quick buck instead yeah. of the long, long $10 <laughs> bill. I don't want that dollar. I want the $10 that might take a year to get Let, let's whichever one Dave or Chuck, whichever one you guys wants to hop on. Why don't you address that again? If you want to go back to the video and discuss some of that too, and some of the other aspects you were talking about. Which uh, and I, I think first off um, there's absolutely nothing wrong. And I'm not, I'm not worried about the person that buys the magazines for a dollar a piece and sells them for $8 when mine's listed at 20. I don't care because they probably have one and they sold it. And mine is up for $20 and that's great. They sold out of theirs and good for them. And if that's their business plan or if they've got specific needs, you know, as, as we always sure. say, you know, if rents do, you need that $8. You can't hold out. Well, tell your landlord, I'm going to pay you in three months when this sells for 20, the landlord doesn't want to hear that. Um, so you have to do what you have to do, you know, within your own situation. That being said, um, I was noticing this morning because there was a comment on our video and I took a look at my last five items as of this morning that had sold, and one had been listed in 2011, and one had been listed in 2012. Now, that's long tail, <laughs> nine years and 10 years on the items. Um, unfortunately, the problem that I have overall, uh, you were talking about price structure, et cetera, et cetera, is unfortunately, I don't think any of us had plans to get where we, where we are. So I've got, I call it the legacy problem, that... I was listing this back in 2011 a certain way. It was not a good listing. I will admit that, you know, right through, it's not a good listing. It doesn't have any kind of structure to it, as you were saying. As of a certain point, um, 2019 or so, I really got my my stuff together. And I really started doing a, a, a plan. And everything after that date is pretty good within the plan. Doesn't mean I don't have a lot of stuff from before then. What, what am I going to do with it, though? It's sitting there. I'm not going to end it. It's not worth my time to sit there and, uh, you know, change it and add new pictures and all that because I've got 20,000 or 25,000 unlisted items. So, of course, I'm going to go and list the new stuff as opposed to going and fiddling with the old stuff because I'm still selling some of the old stuff, obviously. Um, and I would say probably getting into the long tail, I would say probably 
a quarter of the stuff that I sell has been listed within the past three months. I'd say about a quarter of the stuff has been listed five years or older, and then 50% falls within the five years to three months ago. That's Let me ask you a quick question months. before you take yeah. off from there. Do you worry about a sell-through rate? Zero, zero percent, none, none whatsoever. You it don't care at all. No, no, not at all. I, I tell people that, and they think I'm crazy. I don't even look at watchers. I don't look at impressions. I don't care at all what the sell through rate is. I care about what the dollar amount coming in is because the majority of that dollar amount come in is all profit. You know, and it's and, and, and it's funny you ask that because we we ran some numbers yesterday on the show. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a fun little live show. We just <laughs> end up working without a net, and I was doing some math. Um, but I sell roughly 5,000 items a year on eBay. I've got, we'll say 15,000 to make the math easy. Five and 15 is 20,000. I sell 5,000 out of 20,000. So I sell a quarter of the items that I have listed in a year, sell within a year. So, and we ran years and it was what, 13%, yeah, something like yeah, that. Half, yeah. yeah. So he's about half of what I am. And that was His a, those are the different though. Started. He's got he's got more quantity going up yeah. than both of us combined, plus yeah, some exactly. every month. So right, and and I think that ties into another thing that I know you've said, and I know we've said. If you've got, and I'm completely making the numbers up here. If you've got a hundred items, and you sell ten items a month out of that, if you go to a thousand, you're not going to multiply your sales by ten and sell a hundred. You're going to sell course. seventy five. That's not work. Yep, right. that's exactly if you, right. If you have a thousand and you made it to ten thousand, you're not going to sell seventy five hundred. You're going to sell forty two hundred, and so on and so on. Definitely it's not so. Like percent keeps going up. Right, right. No. Unless you have 100% perfect <laughs> items and everyone is going to be a winner, everyone's going to sell for top dollar. It's not going to happen anywhere on the planet. So there's no set you sell so many of anything that's going to work. None of that works for reselling for second hands and stuff. Chuck, you want to you want to take it off from there? Yeah, um for me, I love my job. I have fun, my employees have fun, we have a great time. What I don't love is getting up at 3 in the morning 7 days a week. So uh, I think at some point it might take a little wear and tear on me five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, you know, my goal, if it's possible, it would be to sell the company at some point, get it to a, an efficient point where I can be turnkey. Uh, by doing that, I need inventory. If someone doesn't want to walk into a half a million or a million items that's listed. That's great. They're listed on even Amazon, but you have nothing else to list. So I look at that as like a, you know, a, a marketing thing for any, anyone that would be interested in buying it down the road. At least, Hey, this guy's got a million items. There's a half million I get, you know, we get some employees, we can keep listing, you know, we don't need to buy anything. We just have the company, everything's listed and we got more to list. So uh, that's something that, you know, it's a goal. It may never happen. And I got to find someone crazy to take over my job, but you never know. <laughs> you might have a family member who wants to step in. You sure. never know. Yeah. There's Absolutely. always options for stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Hang on. One thing now I wanted, I wrote this down because I don't want to forget it because Dave mentioned something about the time length, having stuff up from 10 and 11 years ago. I, I sell stuff almost every day that's been up for five years plus, yeah. almost yeah. every day of the week. The one philosophy, at least nowadays, in the last two years, like we talked about with eBay changing the, the amount of insertion fees and giving us all this huge bonus break back to us, is that once I list it, I have no more, it costs me nothing whatsoever to keep it up. So I see people that will list stuff for a week. They'll relist it once. They take it all down and then just discount it or just trash it out. Right. I used to do that. That used to be the way people did stuff because everything was auctions back then. Right. That used to be what I did myself 20 yeah. years ago. If it didn't sell, I'd run it once, maybe twice, and then I'd trash yeah. it. Figured, Who's going to want it after that? Yeah. But the, the point of it is, though, that this is how you get the volume. This is how you get quantity because once it's up, you sell something out of that lot or whatever you listen, you get your money back out of it. Yep. You've got zip zero into it once it's sitting there. Exactly. So it can, you know, propagate across the internet. It can start to show up in Chrome months later and then stay there. And it, it, it's, it's no other expense or burden to you if it's not something right. that's big or you've got the space for it. So that's how our stuff has grown. We've sold enough of this. We list a big lot. We buy a thousand of this, 2000 of that. I list a few hundred. I sell something that pays for the entire purchase and makes us our money back. And then I, I'll weed a lot a little bit here. So I'm rotating what we list. And, you know, th that's another question leading into that too, that I wanted to bring up here. When either one of you guys are listing, I'll, I'll just quickly go over my, my, uh, 
plans. When we list something, I've got a, a long, I used to do 90 day, now it's six months or longer. I'll set up what I'm going to list on a given day. I don't list the same thing all day long. We'll rotate. So there's action on many different categories that we list yeah. at any given time to give action. So I'm not just going to spend one straight week listing one single type of item. Um, I think it helps the store. And I do see a gain of it because I'm attracting attention from multiple different categories instead of just one bigger, broader reach, your fingers are stretched out, you've got to reach. What's your, either one of you want to hop in and then whichever one hops in first, this other one can go in second. Give us give us your ideas on that thought. As it's, well. it's funny you say that because that was actually, I just made myself a note. If you saw me writing or not, I just made myself a note that I was going to bring that up. You had mentioned in a video recently um, where you felt that that was working, that if you listed into a into a category it's enough to show on a piece of paper on a spread uh, a cell uh, spreadsheet thousands of worth of listings that show an increase over doing that versus a thousands of others of like to like items that don't show it's not a huge increase but eight nine percent is fine with me well i'll give a perfect example i picked up some uh original artwork uh two different pieces that have flash in it was that from and heritage went, heritage yep yep and i listed those and I just, I listed them oh, three days ago, four days ago. I just sold a Warner Brothers catalog with Flash on the cover. Now that didn't just all of a sudden sell because somebody said, hey, he's got a, they found it from that listing. And that happens all the time. In fact, I do the, much like you do, I do the offers to buyers regularly. I, all during the day. All day long. Anytime and it's I have so a chance. funny because I'll list something in the morning and then I'll look three hours later and somebody would be watching that exact same title, a different, you know, a different issue of that title. And I said, they found that off my new listing. And I find mm -hmm. that all the time. If you if you list uh, across like that, it definitely helps. And I would rather, unless mm -hmm. unless you're trying to build critical mass in a category, which again, different if you story. want to do that, it's a different story. But otherwise, you're better off listing five of this, 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 because it gives you action across five different categories. You're As not just getting five more. people from one specific category. You're getting 25 from, yep. you know, five different categories. So, yeah. yep. And I, so I've sworn by that for a long, long time. Same and I, I definitely, I, obviously I can't prove it works, but I know that it works. If that makes sense. I know I, I do the math and you know, I, I can't, they're not 100% identical items, but when you're doing a quantity of several thousand of identical from the same category, same basic, everything era type <clears throat> instruction versus the exact amount of ones that you are, are, you know, bouncing back and forth and things like that. I've got several stores so I can do stuff like that. So you can kind of see whether you get influx from, other items, just like tied up items, like items that may be in different categories. But let's say you got like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, like a Star Wars VHS tape, a Star Wars action figure, a Star Wars poster, all three different categories, you know, but well, I guess technically people do list them in the same category on many occasions, the collectible sci-fi Star Wars or something. But in that case, you're actually getting the, you're using the same title of Star Wars and you're able to draw people from three different categories at the same time instead of just one. So that's another reason why if I've got like, I'm listing say a hundred of something, all those hundred items are, are identical basic items, like a, a 1910 postcard from Boston, we'll say a hundred different scenes. I'll list them possibly in two different categories, possibly if there's a way. So that way I get attention from two different categories instead of just one. I'll list say 50 of them in one category and 50 of them in another. Like, let's say I got a military eight by tens. I can list those in collectibles photos and I can list them in collectibles military. So I'll do, you know, 50 in one and 50 in another. And I always put a note. I have many more, but I won't say the category in my description box. So when they go down to the description, if they happen to go down there, they'll see that, hey, he's got more of these for sale and they'll see them either way. So, but it's a way to get double the exposure from two different categories at the same time without paying. I never pay for two categories. I only split up quantity half in one category and half in another. It's the, it's the free way to do double categories in my book. It's the only way that I would do it personally. Do you guys ever use that, either one of you? No, no. Yeah, never I think we used to, year, used to years ago, but not anymore. No. And I don't mean to cut uh, Mr. Magazine off um, again. again, but... Um, just tying to what you just said there, as far as, okay, you pick up a hundred Boston postcards and you list them. What I end up doing, especially during the summertime when you got the flea markets, estate sales, et cetera, et cetera, I may actually pay more than I usually do 
after that, if I'm at a sale and I see Boston uh, things, so in other words, you've got a couple of booklets from Boston, I'm going to say, geez, you know, I usually pay a dollar a piece on booklets. They want three bucks a piece. I'm still going to make money. I'm still going to list them at 20 to $25, but I'm going to buy those on purpose because I know I've got those hundred postcards sitting there and it ties into that. And I'll give you the perfect example. We talked about it on the show yesterday. Um, I ended up buying, oh, I don't know, 120 uh, treasure hunting magazines, you know, lost treasure and all that kind of stuff. I used to read those as a kid. I love those I magazines. Paid $25 for the 120 of them. So I did okay on those. Well, I've got them all listed. I did the old school listing, the quick listing, the cover, the table of contents, got them all listed. Now, when I'm out, I always walk by them. Now I'm going to buy them on purpose because I've got the critical mass of those now. So when I go to a sale and I see two, three, I used to walk by them. Now I will buy those just because I've got a crit critical mass of them. And if I list, <clears throat> if I find three at a sale in three weeks and I list those, that will draw traffic to the ones that I already have. So it definitely is a, is a good way to do things. Yeah. So for me, I'm, I'm sure you do the same thing. I have to prep all my items for all my employees. I do whether that. that's a control thing or they don't have the knowledge. Um, you know, they're not experts by any means, but I gave them them specialties. Like I said before, one guy's just listing DVDs. One guy's listing, you know, Amazon sports cards. One's doing eBay sports cards. So I do all the prepping, which takes time, obviously, but I love things that I'll call them automatic inventory things that I can just give them and not have to prep. So like DVDs just have to be scanned, stuff like that. Uh, you know, if you, or, they're all, um, I'm going to say car magazines, which we're not listing right now. But, you know, if I give one of my employees, here's 100 car magazines, they're all Motor Trend, you know, $16.99, whatever it is, you know, so I want to keep it simple. But there's some things, especially adult wise, where I have to put post-its on every one. I'm not going to call myself an expert, but I've been dealing with this stuff a long time. So my employee that lists this stuff may not know some of the, you know, actresses that I would know. But um, I, it's fun. I like doing it, but it is time consuming. Um but other than that, you know, we're always hitting different areas uh, for sports cards. Let's say Tom Brady threw five touchdowns. Well, don't list just football cards. Now I got 200 Tom Brady's get those on. Cause we don't want to sell them a year from now. when we got them in our hand right now. So some of the stuff we try to do trending, especially the new sports card boxes. We know those are hot. Now we're going to sell them now instead of two years from now. But, uh, you know, Before the price could cover, drop. What's that? Before a price could drop. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and, and something rather like that with, as you were talking about the Beanie Babies and all that kind of stuff yeah. earlier. Fidget spinners. Fidget spinners. I hit those too late, one day late. <laughs> you either want to, you either want to sell when the price is high, or you want to put them away and sell them 10, 15 years afterwards, as you can tell with all the junk wax and yeah. all that stuff. That now all of a sudden that stuff's hot again. But you could have bought that stuff for five, ten dollars a box all day long right. for year after year after year. And the poor people that bought them at the high price were selling yeah. them at ten bucks just to get rid of them. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Yeah. Some some cases I've taken way less than I wanted to. Well, not like I'll, I'll use a George, for example. That's just one example. I've done it many, many times, but get out while the going's good. The price was still, we got like 1200 for the magazine. I was, you know, I could have probably held on, but again, the price has crashed since then. So shortly after I sold it, they're selling for far less than what I sold it for. Yeah. So a lot of items are, again, hot items like a, a talking Elmo or something like that. If you were in at the right time, you know, and get in and get out, Beanie Babies, for example, I personally think, you know, the trading card will have a crash. You're not going to see $5,000 first edition trading cards from Marvel Universe 1 from 91 Crazy. and Pels Absurd. because, you know, I, I have boxes of that stuff here and I still haven't even listed it. You know, I mean, garbage pill kids. There's a million Hard garbage pill kids. Everyone's got sets of them, it seems, but they're hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Crazy. I've got probably five of uh, 5,000 count, you know, the big 5,000 count card boxes of just the first, second, third, and fourth garbage pails sitting here. I, I haven't even went through them, honestly. I know the originals because they're the same ones I remember yeah. stuck all over everybody's lockers at school and stuff like that, too. I'm sure you guys have the same, same, same thoughts on that as well, yeah. too. One question um, I've gotten to here. In fact, where's the other question? I, I'm scribbly these days. Um, well, let's talk about Christmas here because we're, we're at the prefaces of fourth quarter, you know, what's volume wise, everybody thinks that you're just already automatically set and everything's going to be great and stuff. There are issues with having volume up. You've got to feed the machine constantly, especially in fourth quarter. For those of you who don't know with fourth quarter, fourth quarter for at least brick and mortar, it used to be like 75% of the entire year for many companies came in the last three months of the year. For those who don't know what fourth quarter is, 
a business does financials every three months, the first, you know, three months, January, February, March, and so on and so on. Each quarter is when the financial period ends for that. So they're three month financial periods. Fourth quarter is the last financial period of the year. It's that month or that quarter that used to like Toys R Us made most of their money, like 75% of all of their profits came from Christmas because everybody buys toys in there. So there's, there's getting everything up for fourth quarter is a huge, huge thing when you have volume because you're going to sell a lot and you don't want to be halfway through and not even be able to, uh, you know, get enough going because all the sales are going hot. So when something's hot, you got to hit. And if you don't have enough going up, you don't have it up ahead of time. You're not going to hit those marks. And, and for us, we have like dollar figures we like to hit for fourth quarter. I know what I want to hit here. I know what I hit the last three, four years out. And, and you've got to set yourself up to do those. What's what's both of your takes on recommendations for for I know everybody doesn't have employees. I do have employees myself. For those who don't know, we do have people working here. Um, but again, even as a single person, as just one what are you guys planning on for fourth quarter? Have you already swung into a fourth quarter mode, which probably you have? Where do you two stand, I guess? We'll just let you swing out from there and address it however you think's the best. Well, it's funny. I um, I mentioned yesterday on our live show, I said it's going to be a year with no Christmas. And by that, I meant um, you got to get your Christmas stuff up soon. Now, I've been putting aside, um, and I realize Christmas sells all year, but my way of looking at it is if I've got, 100 treasure magazines that come in and two Santa Claus magazines that come in. I want to list those 100 treasure magazines right now and I'll put the treasure ma or the Santa Claus magazines off in a pile. Well, I've been doing that all year long and I've got a big pile of Christmas stuff and I kind of want to get it up by Columbus Day. That's my goal. I don't think I'm going to make it because I keep buying. <laughs> Went today on a big buy of stuff as well. So I've got a car full of stuff to, to bring in as well. Um, but that's my first point is. You definitely want to get the Christmas items up. If It's a little different for a lot of what I sell because, believe it or not, a lot of people don't give a, uh, you know, a January 3rd, 1966 Newsweek as a gift. Just not a hot gift. Um, now, for, for Mr. Magazine, it's a little bit different because he sells a lot of the toys and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he gets a lot of that up and, and for sale quickly because he has to have that up for Christmas. Um, that being said... We did, a, we did a video a while about uh, ago about the fourth quarter, and you just want to get as much stuff as you possibly can for it for a, for a number of different reasons. Number one, with me working as a one-man band, if sales do pick up, I don't necessarily have the time to be listing a lot. So it's, it's almost like the ant and the grasshopper. I've been listing extra all the way through just so that way, if I've got less time to list over the holidays... I've still got enough stuff up uh, because even, even for the stuff that I sell, sales definitely do pick up. You definitely do see a pickup, not certainly not 75% or anything at all like that, you know, because again, I'm selling older items. But yeah, I but you, my... you, you sell stuff. You, I don't have a big dip in the summer at all. My stuff is pretty much constant all year round. At least these days it has been for like the last mm -hmm. three years. Would you, would you agree both of you on that too? Oh yeah. I, I would say, I would say it, it only seems like a dip because it's less than what you get around Christmas time. And so it isn't actually a dip, but if you look at the numbers, you say, geez, that's lower. Well, yeah, it's lower, but that's it's not still a high years. number. Yeah, exactly. I'm doing fourth quarter and I've been doing fourth quarter numbers for geez, a couple of months. I, I put something on sale overnight. And so I said, what did I do? I actually canceled it like hours later thinking, oh man, what am I doing? Because the sales are still rolling in. I thought I'd do a little push, but I'm not going to even do that. I mean, the sales are, are good still. And, and I guess the one other thing, if I could go off on a bit of a tangent for a second here, we're in unprecedented times as far as with everything having going on in the country and it's been going on for the country for the last year and a half. And I know your sales are really good because of, you know, a lot of people have, have has helped. I ha hate yeah. to say it in that yeah. way, but it has. It has. People have discovered online sales and buys, you know, and they buy something and they're happy about it. And, oh, wow, I can trust this website. I can trust this seller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can't really, the last year and a half worth of numbers, even in my day job, I work for the state in my day job. When I deal with businesses, what I tell the owners is let's discount the last year and a half as far as long-term trends, because it's it's a black swan event is what it is. It's just, it's a one-off. We don't know. It'll be interesting when everything completely opens up and uh, hopefully soon, but when everything totally opens up, seeing where the sales are at when when the pandemic is completely passed. That should be an interesting uh thing. Hopefully they stay high and hopefully a lot of people stay with buying things online and stay with buying things from all of us. 
I think that's what's going to happen. That my predict my prediction is that this this trends because my 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 graph trend is it's been trending up for a while. I, I think it's brought the people here. People are going to be nervous about public and disease and everything else going along. So I truthfully see this as a, a people would have never got on net before are now on net and buying stuff online and realizing, wow, I can get almost anything I want. I don't have to drive all over the place. I think it's it's cheaper for them. And they're able to, instead of spending the money driving around, they're spending more on the internet and they get more out of it is what I see personally. But Chuck, you want to? Yeah. Um, for me, um, again, I took that hit with eBay. So since that, the, uh... They eliminated the Dell category. I've been dumping everything into Amazon, all my listers for 90% for the most part. Um, but eBay used to be two to one, I think, Amazon for sales. And I think, and even listings too, we had double eBay than we did Amazon. I think by this Christmas, we'll have double Amazon listings and double the sales by Christmas compared to eBay. So I'm going with what's working. Um, we're, we're pounding Amazon now. We're, we're already in the Christmas season as far as that goes. I don't do much of Christmas items per se. Um, though I did send out a bunch of the um, trade Christmas trade cards to get graded. So I think I'll have those in time. In a Which couple ones weeks. were those? Um, I picked up a trade card collection, Victorian trade card, uh, 10,000 oh, of them. Okay. And then um, we haven't been listing very many, but I, I took about 150 of them. I got to send them out to SGC to get graded. Um, they're running a special, and I think I'll get them back in a couple, two, three weeks. So hopefully I'll still hit that Christmas window. But other than that, um, we don't do much Christmas items other than just pounding toys and pounding things on Amazon right now. And, and let, let me just, because a lot of people, I've been selling vintage and collectibles on Amazon for five years, maybe, maybe longer than that. A lot of people, well, I don't know if everybody's able to get in, but where do you list most of your vintage magazines? Would you, you know, if it's a secret to you, that's fine. I won't be offended at all. I'll tell you that I know people as well as I have listed them in wall art. I don't know if you list them in books or where. I can, I can, yeah, yeah, we do books. Yeah. books I personally yeah. can create my own ASIN numbers. I don't know if you guys have, are engaged where you can do that. I, you must be, right? Yeah. Yeah, they've done a little bit of changes on it that we're looking into because now they're um, they they made some changes now. When you do list from scratch, you got to list the uh, number of pages in the publication and all kinds of other little changes. So we're we're working through that over here. We got some links and we got some contacts, so we're helping us work through it. Okay, let's hop off onto uh, Christmas wise. Everybody knows what I do. I pretty much uh, list Christmas all year round, but I list it at the high end. And I don't care if it sells or not. If it waits till Christmas and sells, I list Christmas items at fourth quarter prices whenever I list them. That's that's just what I always do. Can it's, I go off on a on a tangent for two shoot. seconds before your next question? Go ahead. Um, I know you've gotten a little bit of grief um, when, when you talk about the number of items you, that you list in an hour. I, I've, you've, you've talked about that before, et cetera, et cetera. I want to give a real world example. Now it's Amazon, which is, which is a lot easier to list on in volume than, than eBay is. But I had a situation where I had 150 entertainment weekly magazines that I wanted to get listed on there. Now they were all in system, but what I did is I put them all in order and I had a certain amount of time before work. I ended up getting 150 entertainment weekly uh, listed on Amazon in 120 minutes. So you can do it. You yeah. certainly can list things. I mean, you've got to prep the things, obviously. you got to get them in order, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. even with the treasure magazines, um, when I got all those, I was listing them. I took all the pictures first, and then I boom, 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 went through them. And I call that old school listing is what I call it. because in the Oh, old that's day, what you were. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, we call it old school listing because, you know, you're just, you're getting it up. You're just, you're worried about the volume. I mean, not the the quality now on an old school listing is better than it was 10 years ago because I am taking the table of contents where I didn't in the past. And in the past, what I used to do on something like that would be, I'd say, Oh, what's the cover say the cover blurb great gold find in the Andes. And that would be what my listing would be. Well, now I actually go to the table of contents and read through it and say, yeah, I think I'm going to mention Oak Island. That might be a better thing to list. Um, yeah. Keywords are huge, huge, huge. Yeah, in the old days, we didn't vintage. worry about that so much. Since you're talking about listing amounts now, like if you're listing books, just get yourself a little barcode scanner. If they've got barcodes yeah. on it, I don't, yeah. people don't understand how quick it is to list anything with a barcode on Amazon. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. DVDs. This, and they're doing 60, uh, I think 16 hour. My employees are hitting DVDs. Yeah. That's it's exact, the exact same thing. And like with Discogs, if I listed a record on Discogs, I don't even need a picture. It's, it's like, 
30 seconds for anything as long as you're good on on your grading and you you stack them together like to like like to like all the all the rock all the garage or whatever you're doing you don't have to change a lot of stuff and it's it's a lot quicker and i'm 45 items in an hour if they're postcards the same category price range and structure you're only doing three changes i promise you i got a video showing me do it you just have to equate out the time Uh, it's it's those are doable numbers when you've done this for your living for you know 10 plus years I, I, I that's that's all i do that's all i do is to figure out ways to speed this up our business for everything i do if you look at my images from day one now we've already updated those trying to get everyone situated it, it's an assembly line process for everything i list everything is an assembly line everything has a step a process that's the same over and over yeah. and over again i don't miss a step because we do it every day the same way everything is a process everything is a posty i mean uh, you've got to have something built into there if you want to get volume and mm-hmm. this is something that i didn't do when i started and i paid dearly by having to go back through and and sort through every single item in inventory once we hit a certain point and try to put it somewhere in a bin and and that was my biggest mistake because i never planned on this happening in the first place nor did i think it would be a business model it was just money to pay until i got a job and right. anyway it's, fun, it's funny you say that because we we have a video up as well where that was one of the one of the earlier videos we did where we're talking about you may be right now listing 15 items and you're saying well, I know where they are. They're all on that shelf. You won't in That's another year. It's going to work five years from now. <laughs> Even a we year. Learned the, we learned the hard way back in 2009 and 10. We were alphabetizing everything. So whether it's records. We record, did that too at one point. Magazine, yeah. Magazines would be by title. And then the next year, it's like, we just can't keep resorting things in. It's, we're going to go broke just paying employees. So then we came up with that inventory code, which has been working good for us since then. It's the same here. You've got to have a process for it all. And that was my first, my biggest mistake was not marking a location for them from day one. That is the biggest mistake I think anybody makes. They don't realize, again, that's why I always recommend digging in and understanding the process for everything. Make sure you understand it. People ask me, well, which site should I sell? And I'm on this one. I'm on that one. Make sure you understand one site before you move on to a second site. Because those mistakes oh, yeah. and, and if you miss a couple items like on Amazon and you're you're just starting off your fulfillment you know rate for your your tracking oh, for your yeah. cancellations a month yep. goes down the tubes and then you're like in penalty mode and they could deactivate listings and I've had act uh, when they did the, the video game fiasco a while ago when they started docking people on I had a whole bunch of Nintendo games shut down on me overnight without a notice or nothing and they didn't even ask for a receipt and Anyway, I had a wholesale deal and, you know, it was just a fiasco and they never did bring them all back. So you, you, you never know too. Um, anyway. Well, you're you know, talking about that. Um, you're you're going to laugh about this. When I first started listing, um, as far as things went, I had things now books, I always put in a box and I always, what I did is I had a, um, I had a word document, uh, that listed what was in what box and I just searched it. So if I sold, you know, Seward's history of Alaska. I did a search on, okay, that's in box eight. And I was able to find it. That's not a problem. But when it came to things like booklets, magazines, and all that, okay, I'm going to put all of the regular size magazines in boxes, but I'm going to put the entertainment ones in a different box. I'm going to put the digest size ones together, but I've got the science fiction over there. And it was just so haphazard, but it was because when I started listing, I didn't know I was going to buy a big science fiction collection. Well, then I'm like, well, I'm going to put all the science fiction together what about the five science fiction I had listed before? Those were back over in the digest size. And then the real problem happens when you sell something. And then you're looking at it going, oh, that's a regular size magazine. Wait, it's not in the regular size magazine. Maybe that's oversized because I didn't See, list the measurements at the time. That's the biggest mistake I think everybody made, including myself, is that it? who cares what the items are? The, what they are means absolutely nothing. I could care less what the items are. If they fit in a bin, I can number the bin. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter. I, I used to keep them together just like that because I thought, well, they're all comic books. They're all, this is Silver, Golden Age. Here's, you know, alphabetical Adam, Flash, and whatever else the case may be. And I thought that was the way to go. And I'd come back in, I'd put a Brave and the Bold after Adam or whatever the case may, I'm doing. And, and from there, I thought that's the way to do it. I, all the comic books are here and this and that. And and you, you don't, once you figure out that that means nothing, that's pointless. You, you don't waste your time on stuff like that. Just, it doesn't, the material is just, is just inventory. It's not your collection. You don't have to sort it. You don't have to, you know, do anything to it. Just 
carefully protect it, store it in a numbered section, and you always know where it's at. And, and don't add stuff to it. You don't have to go back and check it again. You know, sometimes we'll condense storage. Like if we've sold a couple hundred 78s out of one rack or something, I might be able to get one less box and just smash them down a little bit. You know, something like that I'll, I'll end up doing. But for those okay. part, once it's up and I got a number on it, I don't like to go back and deal with it again. You know, well, I can I give I, you a quick little insider tip, though? If you are using an inventory system on magazines, what I found works really, really well. Say I've got um, and, and the reason I store my magazines together is because they fit well in magazine boxes. But, you know, my magazine box might be M1, M2, M3, whatever it happens to be. If I sell a magazine in M1, a tip that I end up using is as I'm going through and I'm looking for a, a January 1955 saga, let's say, I'm sorting through it. If I find magazines that start with A or B, I'm pulling them out and putting them near the front. And it just you're just sorting through it anyway. I'm in there anyway. And, oh, there's something, there's a, a magazine that starts with a Y. Let me put that toward the back of the box. And so without even really trying to sort, it ends up saving you time in the long run, just accidentally sorting like that. That's just, it, I find that does save me time to do something like that. Now they're not perfect alphabetical, but after I've gone to the box 10, 15 times, and then I sell a magazine that starts with a B, I bet it's probably near the front of the box and it does end up saving you time without really going through and sorting it all out alphabetically. I do something similar to that like, because a lot of times people have a question, is this here? I get a lot of questions on magazines. Is there an article titled this on such and such page and stuff like that sometimes? And if, if anybody asks a question on any item, it goes in the front of whatever the file is every single time because half the time they buy it and then I don't have to go back and look for it and all. Hang on one second here. Talking about Mike earlier, Radio radio guy, Mike, we got Mike Petraglia. I know I might probably pronounced it wrong. I know I've probably done that before, but Mike there, thank you very kindly for the $5 super chat. You guys both know Mike. Um, I've, again, Mike's the longest person I've ever known on YouTube from my channel. The very first person to reach out to me and, and, and stuff. Mike's a very nice guy. Um, I know he's over the 10,000 mark too and stuff. So thank you very kindly, Mike. It, it's always nice to have you on, of course, but. I in radio do. parts, actually, he um, turned me on to watching you. So we wouldn't be on the show right now except for him. Mike's a real good guy. He's very knowledgeable. Paper Goy turned me on to watching you. So it's a little trickle effect going on here. <laughs> well, I, hopefully that's a good thing. Yeah, he's not not uh, pushing you on my channel. You guys probably know a lot of the same stuff I sell, too, probably anyway. So yeah. at least and we uh, still learn from you, though. That's the key. And, and oh, yeah. definitely learn still. Like I said, we... And we, we mention you regularly regularly in our Bolo videos um, because, and I, and I know somebody, you, you you learned it from somebody else with the um, the scans where you do the zoom in. Works I learned that from my biggest competitor at one time in, in Victorian trade cards. And ever since I've, I, I tell people this all the time, look at where what, who you're up against. The number one thing I want to know, like with buttons, I, I got a quarter million dollars up in buttons. I guarantee you I have more value I probably got double what the guy who has more buttons up. He's got a couple hundred more buttons up. And once I hit that number, I'm I'm in dollar value ahead of him and everything else. I want to be the dominating, dominating factor in there. I mean, I totally lost my train of thought on there where we were going with that. You talk about the zoom in. Oh, the zoom in. Yeah, yeah. And um, my competitors, I'm always comparing where I'm standing and the competitors because if if I dominate a category, like you guys talk about it too, I've seen your, some of your videos where you talk about that, running a category. And again, this isn't something I ever thought about. I never said, hey, I want to run this. I want to have more of this up or more trade cards or buttons or uniform pieces or postcards or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. I never said I, I want to have the most, but watching, you know, uh, seeing his warehouse and stuff was an eye opener for me from the standpoint of how much stuff I got and, and stuff like that. So the dominating factor in there, I think, is a huge aspect of, of, I mean, you've got control over the category. You can help control the prices. If you are you're have more up than everybody else, you're selling more than everybody else. So, again, this is why I, I price higher. Eventually, mine's going to dominate the area, and everybody's going to looking at ended prices, and they'll have to raise them and thinking, oh, these guys selling all these. So it'll help, hopefully help to increase the value of my value as well, too. So I know I went off on a tangent there. but Well, another thing, that, and we did a video about it a while ago, is everybody now with TerraPeak, everybody's using TerraPeak to, to do research. And I said right now is the wild, wild west. And by that, I mean you have the opportunity right now to do really good listings and be the one to discover 
uh, almost like the, the, the new world. You're the one discovering it when you put the things up because nobody else, you know, you take a look at things. And I always use Terapeak to take a look at my competitors to see how they listed things. And sometimes I learn off of it. Like, wow, Harlem Globetrotters are in that magazine. I didn't see it my first time through. Oh, there they are. Let me put that picture up. And other times you're looking at it going, nobody mentioned the Brooklyn Dodgers are in it. And we show it on our Bolo videos all the time. I'm getting $30, $40 out of an item that other people get 10 to 15 out of. Well, every day that happens for us. Because they never mentioned it. But I'm smart enough to know in that competitive Keyword. advantage will be gone because people will use the therapy and say, hey, eight people sold this for 15. One guy sold it at 40. He's got different words than everybody else. I'm going to use that guy's words. I mean, hopefully people are smart enough to end up doing that, unfortunately. But now is the time to to go and hit on those keywords because you can be the one, the trailblazer basically on that. Having, having the most up though, that's again, running the category and having the titles. I, I tell people all the time, if I see a dozen of something selling for $9.99, I might put 30 bucks on it right off the bat, regardless of what those other dozen people sold it for, because people copycat. If one person sold it for 10 bucks, they're yeah. going to assume 10 bucks, the second one, the third one. Everybody's going to say, well, 10 bucks, it's a quick 10 bucks and stuff. I'm going to say every one of those dozen people underpriced it because they bad keyword. They missed this. They missed that. I'm going to put 3450 on it. And chances are I'll sell it for at least two and a half times what they sold it for most of the time. Well, not always two and a half, but at least double. No, no yeah. question about that. It well, I'll give really another, I'll give another quick, and I'll, I'll give away one of my secrets because it's not a big deal. Um, I'm sure you've seen it before. It's a yellow covered book and it's got um, Burma shave and it lists all of the different Burma shave um, slogans that they used back in the day. You can go on, people list that in the books and it goes for four to five dollars in the books. You find them regularly for a dollar. I sit there and I put them in the collectible shaving area and they go for $15 all day long. And not that $15 is a lot of money, but I'm getting 15. Whereas if I put it in books, I'd get five. We do so, that all the time. The yep, same take a look at what, you, what your competitors have, where they have it listed. And if it is an item that, hey, they're only getting $9, where do they have it listed? Well, why do they have it listed there? I'm going to be the person listing in this different area and you can end up making sales. We do that with, I know, and eBay hates it though. You know that, don't you? Like I'll list <laughs> something that's not a comic book because it shows something comic, a Superman item or something in the comic book section. I always get more money for those items in the comic book section because someone's looking for Superman, say specifically. They're buying comic books. I've got like a Tumblr from 76. It's got Superman on the side or a, a promo giveaway Superman vehicle from back of a Cheerios box or something like that. The toys or the, the prize premium section under collectibles and lunchbox area where that is, isn't the best place. The comic book sections where I would always sell those items for money, just like um, a real photo postcard of a military, something military. I'll list that in military section a day of the week because it's going to get more money because more people are looking in there. If they go to the postcard section, they're flooded with hundreds of other things that people don't know what they're talking about usually. And they, they, they have to weed through all this junk just to find something. If you just put it where they're looking, they're going to see it. That's another reason why the whole media mail block and other categories is a nuisance because eBay's trying to get you to stick it over there, make it easier on you. But if it's a bona fide media item, and it sells better in this category, even though eBay says it shouldn't. It does. And I know it does because we've been doing that for years. Like um, military books do better in the military section. They've added a military book section, but they didn't used to have that in there. Every book that I had military related goes in. If it's a World War II book, a World War I book, a Spanish-American War book. It went in original items from there before they added the book section in. And, and still, even like book sections and secondary categories that aren't in the, the book main category, they still block out media mail in those categories. It makes no sense. But now I'm ranting. I know. No, we're, we're, we're in complete agreement. <laughs> it's been like that for far too long, and they're aware of the problem. And that's uh, something. I don't know on. if it is a problem. I think it's something at this point, if they couldn't fix it after it, I reported the media mm -hmm. mail issue. I'm going to shout out a name here, and I don't usually do that. Brian Burke is an executive at eBay. If he can chide me for this or not, I've admitted that, told him that I've, you know, I've called it out that I told him personally, and we talked. I had his his account on LinkedIn and everything, and he just never, nothing ever happened with, him, and it still happens. So you know, they know it. I hundred percent, one hundred percent know they know it, and they've known it for a year. And if they haven't fixed it for at this point, it's intentional. 
There's just yeah. don't tell me these they can't run their own site. They can't fix an issue they caused. It's intentional. There's no other yeah. way around it. Yeah. They're trying to control where we list the stuff without telling us specifically yeah. in my book. I think it's a way to, to get us to list it somewhere else because it'll just be easier on you. They don't have to have a fight over people. They just cut you off shipping it. You won't want to keep going somewhere else is what I think they were thinking. But well, one of it, our subscribers called eBay about the problem and they were told by an eBay rep, uh, just go to PayPal and use PayPal shipping. I've had a dozen and, people. And that was that. before, you know, that was after they were broken apart. And I'm saying if your workaround is to use an alternate company, there's a problem. <laughs> That's that's a good like pirate ship. You know, what do they don't know this stuff's out there, you know, because they they, it, it's crazy on that kind of stuff here, too. And who knows what's going to happen in what October 12th when the new one rolls out and they switch categories with postcards and all that kind of junk. Who knows? I don't trust them to to effectively. I don't want to steer this to just a complaint about eBay. But I think if I do an eBay complaint video everybody thinks um why are you biting off the hand that feeds you hmm. if the hand that's feeding me is not really feeding me they're holding their hand out and as soon as i go to grab it they pull it away that's not helping me you know i ebay used to be like 95 percent of my revenue it's less than 50 percent. it's almost down to literally the 40 percent mark so it's not my fault i didn't do right. it i pulled i stopped listing records on ebay when they screwed around with the item specific and made up categories like pvc records it's styrene. It's not PVC. That's the one that gets that really, really aggravated me. They don't even know what they're talking about. Maybe it's technically the same technical type of plastic, but every guidebook out there and every collector calls it styrene. They don't call it PVC. I had to look it up to make sure what they were talking about. I'm like, PVC. Again, it's, it's stuff like that that drives me nuts. Well, I think uh, sometimes eBay, and, and, and this is true of any large corporation, I think they forget that we're their partners. When you come down well, they to know, it, they know that they're there. I think that they know when it's all about money at this point, they're going, I, I hate to say this because I've, I've been a, a devoted eBay user for, for pretty much most of my life. The, the CEO, again, he, he's a Walmart guy. This is all steering the, the paper clicks, all the stuff steering towards trying to be Amazon, trying to be, again, they're third place. Now they're going to be fourth place. If it keeps going like this again, I'm not wishing that I wished everybody had the great platform we had, but we had, 10 years ago when everything was still you could sell a you know a broken broken stick of wood for you know 20 bucks and stuff i mean just an example i mean you could sell pretty much anything 20 years ago for sure um with I, no I, pictures well <laughs> yeah, no yeah pictures. exactly the, the, the point though is that i think they're looking for the big quick dollar because we're we're you stuff doesn't mean anything to them it's not replenishable to them it's not a company that's going to sell $10 million of the Nikes a month on their platform. It's not where the money is. And they're, if you've watched, they follow their stocks and the only reason they're up now and pandemic and they've got a, you know, before that, you know, the only reason they were gaining more ground and money is for more fees. You know, it wasn't from selling more volume. It was from, from selling, selling us more services. So that's not a, a sustainable model. You can't just keep banking on increased revenue from from the same clients you've always had without gaining the the overall mass of clients it doesn't work that way eventually well, at least at least though they did with their fee changes that was something it to benefit that's all a good of us thing, yeah but, but but the point i still people have been throwing around these these rumors and stuff and and there's somewhere out there there's supposedly an internal document that's fooling out i haven't seen it if somebody has it i don't want it if it was ripped off from e, from ebay but there's supposedly a document going into some of this stuff. I don't know if it's true, but I've, I've heard it. Several people said they've seen it. It's all planned. I mean, they've got some scheme they're trying to do with what's the, the stage of what the business is going. And, you know, I've heard people talk that this is all set up to, you know, push big business in and we can't compete with pay per clicks, you know, and if, if they're pushed up, you, I, I can't spend 500. The example they give you in the pay per clip example is $500 a day. Can you <laughs> see that? Yeah, yeah. Five hundred dollars a day yeah. is what their example is. Not five, not ten. To say, hey, it's not even designed. It's not even. It's not even advertised like it's towards the normal person anymore. So again, CEO is Walmart. Guy who killed the nook should have no business running a company after that, in my opinion. Opinion can opinion. Brought somebody else in from Walmart. The strategy has changed. They're steering towards pay per click again. Amazon, you know, is looking better and better. You know, the way things are going. As Mr. Mr. Mag here is saying, he's listed more on Amazon and his sales have doubled at Amazon while eBay is cutting off forms of revenue from the site, like whacking off the, the adult magazine, adult items, 
cutting off for quite some time a lot of coin sellers. I haven't listed a coin since they did that, even though I've got hundreds of good coins here, because yeah. maybe next month they'll decide they don't want to do it either. You know, who knows? Oh, we'll, we'll, yep. Go ahead. If you guys got some some more want to touch on that, we'll... we'll um, not on that, but I wanted to do real quick, a quick shameless plug. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're, you're open and free. Starting uh, next Tuesday and every Tuesday thereafter for probably six, seven weeks at least, we're and you're, you're definitely going to like this, and you're definitely going to like the fourth one in the series. We're doing, uh, every Tuesday, putting out a video about the warehouse, and it's going to be really in-depth going through the warehouse and how we have things set up. and they're actually really good videos. Um, we we invested in a well. I hope you'd microphone. say they were really good videos, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, we invested in a wireless microphone and all that, so the sound is actually really really good as well. Which is which is always a problem if you're trying to do it off phones and everything like that. So we, we actually made made these really good as far as that goes, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and we never do we never do second takes. We always go without a net. I mean that's just the way we do our our show on our channel. And there are a couple of moments in the third video where Mr. Magazine has some logistics in place that I was unaware of. And you can actually see the surprise on my face and like, whoa, you do that? I had no idea to do that. And I think it's good for anybody watching it because we were talking earlier about the logistics and about how you have to set up your inventory and how you have to do all this. We touch on all that in those videos. And I think anybody, no matter what size you are, is going to learn and take something away from those. Storage is one of those things that you really got to get down right off the bat when you first start. Now, that's no exaggeration. That's, again, my biggest mistake was not storing things properly, labeling them. That was my first huge, massive mistake. I mean, it cost us a day and a half straight. Like, I think the wife, me, both kids worked. Geez, for, it was a day and a half for all of us. I mean, it was a long time because we had to go back in and not only did we have to sort them, but then we had to go into every single, we had like 1,500 lists and we had to go in every one and put where it was. You know, with the alphabet uh, thing wasn't working and it just, it got and to And I be did the same thing when I when I moved, I was moving all the inventory over anyway. And that, I, that you know, when I ended the 3,000 listings and all that, I used the custom SKU, I, I put everything in a box and noted what box it was in and it saved so much time. Because the other problem with not having the inventory coding is, which you, which you don't think about, you sell an item. And, and especially back when I first started, I was selling items for, you know, eight, ten dollars You end up spending a half an hour to an hour trying to find an item. And at some point you're saying, I'm actually losing money. And the real your problem, time. which the real problem, which gets into your head is I've been looking for 40 minutes for this. I could look another 20 minutes. And here's the real problem. There's no guarantee I'm going to find it at the end of the 20 minutes. I may have an hour into it and not be able to find it. And oh. whereas if you have the inventory codes, you don't have to worry about that. Now, and you've done videos about it. We've done videos about it. Sometimes something gets in the wrong box. It's in the box yeah. next to it. You know, you take the stuff out and you leave it on top. You come back and what box was this in? And it goes into the wrong box. But you've done the videos where you give the tricks on how to find, you know, when was it listed? What box should That's it be? That's always so, easy enough, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that happens very rarely compared to the way I used to do it. Yeah, we're pretty... I haven't had to find something. And, I mean, we went through all the old listings. Anything that was up for the three years or more, we manually, physically pulled. I ended up ending, like, seven or 800 listings all in one day. And then I think this was recently. Um, that's why we have been working a lot and we're well over 30,000 now, but we, we ended another like 270, I want to say within that same time frame. Um, just because they're old listings, they needed this, they needed too much work. And I figured this should have been in a lot to begin with. And my pricing back then was terrible. The photos are awful. You know, if I'm going to scan it, I'll just take it all the way off and scan it with some other items that are similar and, you know, it, it just made for a better, better uh, result at the end of the day. And when I do that, usually we sell a bunch um, either that or we we didn't have a uh, the duplex scanner back then. So any postcard we've been scanning over, just drop them in and off they go. And all you got to do is update the photo and eBay. We raised the price at the same time. So every item that was below nine ninety nine is now nine ninety nine. I think the lowest item in my entire store is nine ninety nine. Mm -hmm. And. Um, we actually thought about raising the bottom end to eleven ninety nine, so raising the price of every item in our store that's below eleven ninety nine up to eleven ninety nine. Because at this point, after seeing sales and results, 
the same people buy it at eleven ninety nine that would buy it at six ninety nine. You know, okay. it's not a huge difference in the collectible field. And if I put it up to eleven ninety nine, they make an offer at nine ninety nine. I'd still take it. I'd come out ahead as opposed to having it nine ninety nine and taking a six ninety nine offer. So people worry that if it doesn't sell, they lower the price. And I, I used to do that. I don't lower any prices anymore. In fact, I've been raising them. You know, left and right. We've probably raised the price, and I'm not going to exaggerate. Probably four thousand items. I've increased the, the overall price and my sales haven't went down. They've actually went up a little bit. Um, I can't say it's because of that, but you know, we were listing more and more and rotating listings and stuff like we talked about here. But um, I think we're just past the hour and a half mark. And I'm going to say we call it quits if that sounds good. Cause I usually don't like to go too long. I know a lot of people here say the shows are too long. I don't think so. I could talk all day long and I think you guys probably could too, but I'll let you guys each take a few moments and get some last thoughts in and maybe your last recommendation. We'll just go uh, left to right, right to left, depending on if you're looking in a mirror or not. And uh, we'll let Dave go first and Chuck will follow and I'll be last up there. Well, first off, uh, check out our videos if you haven't. I, as as you pointed out laughingly, I think I just good. dropped the link. So there's a link to the <laughs> channel. There's many I think they're good. Um, I think the biggest thing anybody can take away from just our conversation, because we're we're a bunch of dinosaurs. The three of us are. We've been on for a long time. We've been doing this a long time, volume for a long time. I think there are a lot of advantages that anybody new has that were not around for us. YouTube was not around. You know, we were all just flying by the seat of our pants as far as that went, you know, because there was no centralized uh, sp spot like YouTube. Now there's bad advice out there, of course. A lot of watch. It. But watch a bunch of different people, find the people that you can trust, find the people that will help you and, and follow them. And, and of course, you're not going to follow everything that I do. And that's one of the, the charms of our channel, if I could use that word, is I'm the small guy working out of my house. He's got the employees. What he does wouldn't work for me. What I do wouldn't work for him. But you might be able to watch it and you might take away a little bit from what you do, what each of us does, and, and you apply it to what you do. Um, and I think the biggest thing that you can learn out of all this, just from us talking, is none of us thought we'd be where we are. And That's 100% true. I yeah. guarantee you that if you have us on again in five years, we're not going to be where we think we're going to be in five years. It, you just you have to go with it, because for all I know, tomorrow I could wind up getting a phone call from one of my contacts and I could be like, Oh, yeah, of course. I, I always knew I'd be selling 1880s German Bibles. Well, I've got 30,000 of them because you just never know. But you have to be nimble and you have to be, you know, as long as you've got the capital and the space, be nimble. And if it's a great deal and it's something or other that you think you can make the money off of and you don't mind listing it, you never know what's going to come along. Don't get yourself stuck in the thing that, well, I'm never going to sell that. I'm never going to sell that because you just never know. It might be 10 or 10 or 11 years later, but it's still, it's still a sale. It's still profit. You got nothing into it at that point. Yes. Yeah. yeah for me, just, uh, if you want to grow your business, make more money, uh, buy, 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 buy. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the name of the game for me. I enjoy it. I love it. And, uh, I'm never going to stop doing that. Yeah. I would say that that's me too. Let me just uh, call out, uh, Matt Bly, the, the, the one, I have why sold one item in three weeks has something changed. I think they're it's again, they're changing stuff up there with it. I've had a lot of people say the same thing. If you're doing offers to watchers, your offers could be, uh, your buyer, your potential buyer could be told that you don't ship to them, which is the issue. I find every single offer I send out eBay tells the buyer that I'm sending it to that. I don't ship to them. Every single one, that happens to you. And I've tested it a hundred times. I can show screenshot after screenshot from the people who got my offers. Again, I, I have got a ton of people that have been helping me with this. Dom has even helped me and sent, and we've went back and forth to test his store and the whole works. It's all screwed up. It could have something to do with that, Matt. I do have an update coming out. I think it'll be out tomorrow. Going over that as well as another error issue I found with eBay that was something they're inputting in there that could be affecting this, which I'll go into some detail on how you can check if your numbers are wrong on that too. But uh, I do appreciate everybody coming on. I sincerely appreciate Dave and Chuck coming on and spending some of their valuable time on with us. Again, I I've watched their videos myself. Good content. If you haven't checked them out, I have a permanent link in the description box right at the top. You can just click that and it'll take you right to their channel, The Million Dollar Peddlers. Mr. Mag and Paper Goy here as well. Chuck with the baseball cap on one more time. Dave sitting smiling on the far right or left, depending on, I guess, whatever your version of right or left is. I don't know what it would be from where I'm at, but uh, I do appreciate everybody coming on. 
We're going to have another show coming up again, obviously, next week. I am on with Dom uh, tomorrow night, I think. Yeah, tomorrow night. Uh, Primetime Treasure Hunter. So if you get a chance to check it out there, too. I think he's going to have a free-for-all conversation with uh, questions answered. So if you've got anything to hammer Dom about or me, you know, that's the place to be tomorrow night. Um, so check it out. Again, Primetime Treasure. We've got the Million Dollar Peddlers. And I wish you all a good night. And thank you all for coming on. If you haven't hit the like button, I know I always forget it. I don't think I said it an entire time for the entire show. Please hit the like button. I'm hey, terrible on it. For what it's worth, we stole that from you. We don't say that either. <laughs> I forget. I get into the conversation and then I totally forget about it. I'm terrible on that. I'm terrible, terrible, terrible. I can't read the chat very well these days, so I do apologize for not being able to see it and see everything as it pops on. But I thank you all, and I hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.